Hello and welcome to African American Health Matters. This is Ed and Pat Sanders with health tips and information because your health does matter. The information in this broadcast is not intended to substitute for personal medical advice. Now before making any decision about your health, please consult a physician or a qualified health care professional. Our organization has over 103 partners across the country who are dedicated to patient education, advocacy, and finding ways to better access health and disease resources for African Americans. This broadcast of African American Health Matters is one of the health outreach tools used to reach millions. Thanks to Cyber Station USA and thanks to you for tuning in. African American Health Matters is a new mobile health text message and multimedia outreach that provides health tips and reminders to subscribers right over their cell phones. Our website, www.AfricanAmericanHealthMatters.com, has updates and information about diseases, tips, audio messages, and later this year, video slices of doctors talking about critical diseases that affect African Americans. African American Health Matters partners with events and conducts focus groups and surveys to find out just how African Americans are accessing their health information. There are critical numbers of African Americans dying from prostate, breast, lung, and colon cancer, but a lot of times it's treated too late. Now even more African Americans are affected by diabetes, hypertension, asthma, high cholesterol, obesity, drugs, and alcohol. And we're still needing continuing education and more information about HIV and AIDS. Our surveys show that we need more ways to access resources available in our community. Yes, and Papa, do you know what? There's a staggering number of African Americans who are not aware of drug discoveries that could save their lives through clinical trials. What we need to do is educate more people about the importance of clinical trials. I agree completely. Drugs that can be used on African Americans and tested in Africa, Brazil, or Jamaica is just not going to cut it. Rather than letting other countries test medicines that will be administered to us, we, as African Americans, need to have a say in the drugs that will be put in our bodies. And the only way to do this is to participate in new drug discoveries. On this show, we'll have all kinds of health tips. Health tips for remembering to take your medication, tips on handling your diabetes, breaking those bad habits, and even inspirational health messages. Here's some news and information for today's program. I was reading the other day about how African Americans should become more proactive about our health. Now, this is from one of our partners, the American Heart Association, about the five warning signs of a stroke. Number one, sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm or leg, especially on one side of the body. Number two, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding. Three, sudden trouble seeing in one or both eyes. Four, sudden trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination. And five, sudden severe headache with no known cause. Yeah, I think that sort of falls in line with some things that I was reading recently. It had a study, a report was published by the Archive of Internal Medicine that looked at about 43,000 African-American women. Uh, They were participating in what is called a black women's health study. Now, when these women started, they didn't have type 2 diabetes, but uh, they were told, some of them were told, to drink soda pop and sugar-sweetened fruit drinks on a regular basis, and we found that they are more likely to develop type 2 diabetes, according to this study. In fact, more than 2,700 of them developed the disease during the 10-year follow-up period. So, apparently, women who drank two or more powered Kool-Aid-type drinks, fortified fruit drinks and fruit juices, a day had 31% increased risk of developing diabetes. Now, the study's author also added that a high sugary drink intake 
is linked to weight gain and obesity, uh, which also contributes to the risk of diabetes. So I thought this was very interesting. Here's an interview with one of our partners, the Medical Education Institute. Let's take a listen. This is the March edition of Sky Radio. March is National Kidney Month, and kidney diseases make up a very large part of the overall health care effort because about one in nine adults has some kind of chronic kidney disease, and it's something everybody should be aware of. Our next guest is Dori Chattel, Executive Director of the Medical Education Institute. She's here to talk about it. Dori, welcome aboard. Hi, Dennis. How are you? I'm doing really good. One in nine, that's an interesting statistic. I suggest people should be staying aware. How can people know about their own kidney health. It would be a great idea if they get their blood pressure checked and if they get a regular chemistry panel done when they have their physical and if their creatinine level is good and their blood pressure is good and if they don't have any protein in their urine, probably their kidneys are okay. But you can have kidney disease without symptoms, so it's good to have that checked periodically. Now, in case of kidney failure, dialysis is very often the solution to serious kidney disease, but apparently dialysis isn't just one thing anymore. Explain to me the variety of approaches are, that are now in this field. Well, there, there are two main types of dialysis. One type is called peritoneal dialysis, where you actually use the lining of the inside of your abdomen as a filter to clean the blood. A surgeon puts a tube in through your belly or your chest going down into your belly, and you fill up that sort of sac that's inside your belly with a sterile fluid, The waste and water flow into it, and then you drain it out again, and you put in fresh fluid. Do that a few times a day, and it will clean your blood for you. So um, most people don't know about that type, even though it's been around since the 80s. I assume you're not able to do the hemodialysis at home. Oh, but you can. Lots of people do. Hemodialysis can be done at home on a couple of different schedules, both of which are better than the typical one of going to a center three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, or Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and doing, say, a three- or four-hour treatment. Since your kidneys work 24-7, the closer you can get to doing treatment 24-7, the better you feel. So when you do hemodialysis at home, you get training, and with a partner to help you, you can do dialysis either every day, say five to seven days a week for two or three hours, and you can do that in the morning, do it at night, do it whenever it's convenient, or you can even do dialysis while you sleep at night. So you get eight hours of treatment, you know, four to seven days a week, usually four to six, And that's about the most dialysis anybody can get. And folks who do more dialysis feel better, live longer. Dory, that's remarkable. I didn't know there were that many options available these days. Thanks for joining us and bringing us up to date. You are very welcome. Dory Chattel is executive director of the Medical Education Institute. We reached her by phone at her office in Madison, Wisconsin. There's a whole lot more to learn on the web at www.homedialysis.org. We have with us today Dr. Robert W. Harrison III, He's a native Mississippian and graduate of Tougaloo College and Northwestern University Medical School with postgraduate training in internal medicine and subspecialty training in endocrinology and metabolism. His past experience includes a 29-year career in academic medicine. He also served at Vanderbilt University, Columbia University, the University of Arkansas, and the University of Rochester. For the past seven years, he was an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. At Arkansas and Rochester, he directed the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism and directed weight loss programs. In 2001, he became an emeritus professor of medicine at the University of Rochester and has since been a consultant on drug development, minority recruitment and clinical trials, and a consultant in product liability litigation. We've been talking to Dr. Harrison recently about obesity and weight gain, so let's rejoin him in this conversation.
to weight gain the same way that we respond to a, a, an increase in, in speed. <laughs> their weight goes up, they reduce their eating until the weight comes right back to where it's supposed to be. Uh, uh, one of the other important things that they do is after they have lost weight, they continue to eat less. Mm -hmm. That's important. Think about Very important. About, uh, you know, about what people do. People, people diet. They lose weight. Yeah. And uh, once they stop dieting over some period of time, they gradually return to the same eating habits yeah. that got them into the state of, of overweight. To be yeah. Old. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Wow, that's interesting. And you know, you were talking about studies about the time of day, and the studies agreed with what you just said. They said it doesn't matter if you eat at nine, at, you know, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon or at two in the morning, it's the same amount of calories. But what the deal was, most people who eat really, really late at night eat the wrong calories. They eat the bad stuff. It, it just tastes better, I guess. <laughs> Well, the, the, the thing that I was talking about was, was uh, is, is often called the star and the stuff syndrome. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing, though, that, that happens with the, this eating eating pattern is I tend to see to what some psychologists call graze. Graze. So, so you, you sit out in the evening in front of the television set, mm -hmm. and then you go in the kitchen and you get some peanuts and you come back. And, uh, a few minutes later, you go in the kitchen. Time to burn that stuff off as well. I, I, I know that, that the use of exercise to burn off calories is is, is popular, but I, I suspect that most of you have uh, go to the gym somewhere. Most of you have, have got on one of those bicycles or, or one of the elliptical machines, <laughs> and you've helped them pump for a half hour or 45 minutes, and the machine tells you that you burned. 120 calories. Have, I mean, have you noticed this? No, I think I've seen it. Right, yeah. <laughs> you burned 120 calories. Well, how many calories are there in a slice of pie? Well, there's like three times that many. Yeah, well, you know, it's like three hundred calories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, you burned 120 calories. Well, you know, you burned 
regard to the obesity, you know, there are questions uh, what, what kinds of diets are recommended, I, uh, the standard, the foundation of a, of a long-term diet. Most of us, I believe, recommend uh, diets that resemble uh, a, quote, normal distribution of, of, of food types. So uh, uh, foods uh, do play a role, an important role in any diet. Um, another concept to consider is the energy density of the food that you're eating. A, a problem with with pie, for example, is that uh, with with it, the high sugar content that pie has, you can eat not just one slice of pie. You can eat two kinds of slices, three slices, because it, it doesn't take up much bulk. Your stomach doesn't get full, and all of a sudden you've consumed half of the calories that you need for the whole day. Yes. So. Uh, one of the things that, that we suggest uh, people consider is that the reason you're eating a salad, the reason that salads play a role in, in, in weight loss, is that, that salads uh, take up a lot of room in the stomach. They're bulky, and yet they don't contain that many calories. We thank you once again and look forward to speaking with you very soon.
you know, we're sitting in our living room and we're having a conversation with Tom Anderson. Right. Tom, you know, we've known you for, it's been about 15 years? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, it's been quite a while, Tom, and we know you are, like, we know you. Because I had my operation in 95. Yeah, you're a prostate cancer survivor, and right. you had you and Ed both had your prostate operation in 1995. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was pretty traumatic. How did you go about, how did that come about? Well, my wife, if it were not for my wife, I would not be here today. I have to agree with you on that one. Uh, because as men, you know, we, we try not to accept certain things, and we try to be in self-denial. Yeah. I started getting examinations probably... I kept having them once a year. I went for my examination, and um, the doc didn't feel anything. But of course, they also make you, you make you take your your prostate exam and take your blood. Mm -hmm. for the, and, the, and you also do a DRE, but also for my for my PSA. They took the blood for the PSA, and about ten days later, mm -hmm. uh, my urologist called me in and said uh, he had good news and he had bad news. And asked me what did I want to hear first. So I told him. Wow. <laughs> he said, "I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do the bad news. Then I'm going to give you good news." No, oh, he decided. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, he said, "We found that you have uh, some cancer in the prostate. Mm. Because I had the PSA, and the PSA came out a little high. Uh, I think it was like a 5.0. Mm -hmm. mm. He said, "Well, to be sure, we're going to do an ultrasound." Mm -hmm. So I had to go in for an ultrasound. The ultrasound is that they go up to you, you go up in the anus and you go right up to the prostate and they take a look and see what they can see. And mm -hmm. they take pieces of that prostate so that they put it under a microscope and try to find out basically if cancer is there. Right. So I waited for that. And when I got, when it came back, he said, yes, you have prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. He said, the good news is that the cancer is located deep inside your prostate. The cells are in small groups and not, run, and not running all over the place. And he said, you got six months to make up your mind what you would like to do. Okay. Whether or not you want to have radiation, whether or not you want to have a radical operation. Uh, he said, that would be up to you, but you have to go out and do a little research on it. So that's what I did. This is a good pause point here, Tom. You have to do your homework. I mean, you right. have to research and... Uh -huh. Do this, and it's not always easy. If you're not internet savvy, especially, uh, you have to find organizations like one of our partners, us too, and folks like that to ask them questions and go to health fairs and things like that. True, that's true. Now, Tom, I need to ask you: Was your PSA going up and down, or was it staying? Well, it was basically, uh, it started at uh, a zero point zero point nine or one, uh, and then it went down to a two. Mm. Ended up going back to Temple University where I work. And tried urologists at Temple University. And I found a person I could believe in, somebody I could talk to. Uh, and so that's what that's what led me in the way. So I knew where it was. So I knew I had to keep an eye on it every year. And what happened, it kept, it started to move a little bit at a time. And when I had it done in '94, it had jumped to 5.0. But the other part of this is also if you have enlarged prostate. Uh, without having cancer, sometimes that gives you eyes. Yes. One reason that uh, the doctor has to put, uh, do a digital to try to feel it, but also they go in and do a, they do an ultrasound to make sure whether they are looking at what they think is what they think they uh, want to see. Mm -hmm. And so I mean that's the way it was done. So we've been talking with Tom Anderson, and, and he's given us a lot of good advice, a lot of good pointers, mm -hmm. and men should really pay attention to what he's saying because it all makes sense. And it's something that's positive. It's going to get you to another state. And it's, it's something that we all need to take in and, and just listen carefully to what was said because it is very important, like Tom said, that men need to get checked out in the early stages, at least once a year get a PSA. But make sure you do it because it's very important. And realize that prostate cancer is treatable as long as you catch it in time. So we certainly want to thank you, Tom, thank for, you, you, for Tom. being a part of this show. And we look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Only on Cyber Station USA. It's true. As African Americans, we have the highest risk of being diagnosed with colon cancer. The good news is that this is a cancer we can do something about. Find out the facts. 
Talk to your doctor about getting a screening test starting at age 45. Learn more by visiting the Colon Cancer Alliance at www.screenmycolon.com or by calling 877-422-2030. That's 877-422-2030. Each week, uh, we bring you tips from our African American Health Matters mobile health text message service. So here's some for this week. Here's one on hypertension. Five ways to cut salt. Know your daily salt allowance. Rinse canned foods. Eat in. Eat fresh and read labels. This comes from John Hopkins Health Alert. Here's one entitled Heart 3300 3000. For your heart, remember less than 30% fat, 300 milligrams of cholesterol and no more than 3,000 milligrams of sodium. This comes from www.fi.edu. We hope through this broadcast and our website, you'll sign on to get health tips over your cell phone. The subscription is free and you can opt out or cancel at any time. So stay on top of your health matters by continuing to tune in to this show as we build on Cyber Station USA. We want to thank all of our speakers, doctors, and guests for their contributions to this show. Be sure to tune in on Fridays from noon to one to African American Health Matters on Cyber Station USA. <laughs> Turn it.